a Center for Quantum Information in, in Quantum Chemistry, and uh, last but not least, our own USC Viterbi School of Engineering and, and the Ming Shei Institute. Um, without their support, this meeting would not have been possible. Uh, if you're interested in seeing the, the talks from the previous meeting, uh, four years ago, uh, you can uh, go to the, the website. Uh, it's, it's listed here. Uh, pretty much all the talks were, were recorded uh, with uh, uh, some of them, unfortunately, not having audio because we uh, decided to skimp and uh, did it on the cheap with a few uh, students who were not as proficient as I hope the professional we have in the back there. So uh, this time around, we, uh, we went expensive and uh, hopefully it will, it will pay off. Now, if you do not want your talk to be recorded, and several people have indicated that, uh, do let me know and we'll uh, simply not record it. But otherwise, uh, all the talks will uh, be recorded and will be made available after the meeting is over. There are a couple of, uh, of new features uh, this time. Uh, we decided to uh, have two best student paper prize talks and those will happen Tuesday morning. Uh, we, we had uh, quite a few submissions and uh, our advisory board uh, generously helped us uh, in selecting um, what we thought were the, uh, the top two talks. Uh, so those will be presented on, on Tuesday morning, uh, half hour slots. There will be one, one theory and, and one experiment talk. Uh, we will also have as a new feature a panel discussion on theory versus experiment in quantum error correction. And that will happen on, on Thursday afternoon. The moderator uh, will be uh, Mark Bird, who's uh, one of the uh, uh, co-organizers of this event. And finally, uh, we will have a tour uh, of the uh, D-Wave 1 Rainier chip, which is being installed at ISI, which is our off-campus location uh, in Marina del Rey, not from the airport. I sent out an email last night uh, asking people to indicate whether they're interested in, in taking the tour. Several people. The reason this happened was that several people contacted me uh, ahead of the meeting and uh, asked if, if they could uh, go and see the box. Uh, it's an interesting box to, to look at, and you can uh, also look inside. Uh, there is a, a very, very small chance that we will actually be able to have it up and running and uh, run some, uh, some simulations or some demos uh, for you. Uh, that should be interesting. Sergio Boisho is, uh, I don't know if he's here yet, um, but he's working hard on, on making that happen. Uh, and, and by the way, your suggestions for uh, what to run on the chip are, uh, are very welcome, uh, seriously. If anybody has uh, anything they, they'd like to try out, uh, we're more than open to, uh, uh, to doing that. Um, so if, uh, if you want to take the tour, there will be a shuttle uh, that leaves. There's a regular shuttle that leaves from USC to, to ISI. Uh, you could use that to go almost all the way to the airport. Uh, or if you don't need to go to the airport, then you can come back here. There's a shuttle that will take you back. Uh, finally, some administrative things. We had a, a last-minute schedule switch, so the uh, tutorials, uh, Andrew Landall will go uh, before Robert Rassendorf. Uh, lunch is up in the, the vineyard room. Um, and the poster session is uh, two, s two floors up from here, uh, right up the stairs as you go. And uh, the posters need to be set up this evening uh, at, at the end of the, the last session uh, at 6. Uh, if you have a poster, please go and, and set it up there. And then the, the poster sessions will actually start tomorrow and last until Thursday. And finally, if you need any assistance with any administrative issues, uh, Anita Fung or Lamia Dabuni are at the front desk and it can help you out. If you haven't uh, registered yet, uh, they will be there uh, the whole morning and probably also later. And so any, any registration can uh, take up with them. Okay, so uh, <coughs> now I. Four years ago, I was a lot smarter than, than this time uh, because I did not volunteer myself to give a talk. And uh, this time, um, I did. And so <coughs> I did not have time to prepare any, any serious introductory remarks. And so I hope you, you will not find it uh, really obnoxious of me to uh, ask you to listen to a four minute video clip from four years ago, which were my introductory remarks then. <laughs> this, this is the advantage of, uh, of having a recording. Uh, and actually, I, I, I checked this out. I was hoping that it would be appropriate. And I realized that I was just going to say the very same thing. I don't think I could say it again as <laughs> eloquently as I said then. So here we go. Four minutes. So I thought I'd start with a, a little bit of uh, historical background. Uh, <coughs> back in the, uh, in the Stone Age, uh, about 10, 15 years ago, uh, there was a lot of pessimism 
on the viability of, of quantum computation. And uh, there were uh, prominent critics, uh, such as uh, Rolf Landauer, who wrote an influential paper in uh, 1995 um, with uh, the title, Is Quantum Mechanics Useful? And in fact, he explained in the introduction that uh, his title was a little sweeping, and he didn't really mean to, to critique all of quantum mechanics. Uh, but uh, <coughs> in fact, his, his target was really quantum computation. And this was uh, shortly after the publication of Shor Shor's algorithm. Uh, so Landauer uh, made the uh, important observations uh, that quantum computation was likely to be very fragile. In particular, he, he pointed out uh, that the computation is likely to suffer from localization, uh, by which he meant something like Anderson localization. And that's not an issue that's received a lot of attention uh, in the quantum computing literature. But then his second point was that um, <coughs> quantum computation might suffer from the following problem. S additionally, small errors, he wrote, will accumulate and cause the computation to go off track. And now this, uh, this was a very uh, insightful critique, uh, which um, of course has to do with, with decoherence. And Landau went on to uh, say, uh, uh, make some qualitative statements uh, to this effect. Um, and he inspired some, uh, some additional works. Uh, for example, a paper by, by Bill Unruh, which was published in the same year, in which he acknowledges as, uh, uh, Landauer's uh, uh, insights into, uh, into this issue. And uh, Unruh decided to uh, make a calculation to, to check whether quantum computers could actually function in the presence of noise. And he writes in the abstract, it is found that for quantum calculations in which the maintenance of coherence over a large number of states is important, not only must the coupling be small, but the time taken in the quantum calculation must be less than the thermal time scale h bar over kt. So he was able to show by analyzing his model uh, that quantum computers would, uh, would not be able to survive very long. And in his conclusions, uh, he makes the following statement. The above analysis has given a preliminary look at the effects of decoherence in quantum computers. It suggests that this problem is going to require some serious thought in order to design systems to avoid the disastrous effects that the loss of coherence due to the coupling to the environment can cause. So serious thought was, was indeed required, and fortunately, it didn't take very long, and uh, in 1995, uh, same year, uh, Peter Shore, and then shortly followed by Andrew Steen, uh, uh, published uh, papers uh, which showed for the first time the viability of, of quantum computing in the presence of decoherence, and their insight was to use uh, quantum error correcting codes. So uh, Shore's paper, um, entitled Scheme for Reducing Decoherence in Quantum Computing Memory, uh, pointed out, uh, let me read again from the abstract, it has shown how to reduce the effects of decoherence for information stored in memory, assuming that the decoherence process acts independently on each of the bits stored in memory. This involves the use of a quantum analog of error correcting codes. So uh, critical insight, which was uh, then also um, pointed out by, by Andrew Steen, in his, uh, I would say, almost companion paper to, to Shor's paper, Air Correcting Codes in Quantum Theory, Steen wrote, a natural link is then revealed between basic quantum theory and the linear air correcting codes of classical information theory. So uh, Shor and Steen uh, set the scene for what was to come, and uh, what was to come is uh, going to be uh, talked about a lot uh, at this conference. Uh, so I'm uh, looking uh, forward greatly to hearing about all the, the most recent developments in the subject. Uh, so let me, let me. All right, that's it. I hope these remarks are, are still pertinent. And with that, uh, I would like to open QSC 11 and invite my co-organizer, Todd Brown, to give the first. Will we see a recording of this the next QSC? Uh, yes. Recording of the recording? Ad infinitum. <laughs> a, a, a next QSC.